Hey everyone, and welcome. Many of you have commented on the 2009 iMac videos, either saying how I should upgrade the GPU or how the screensaver trick didn't work well. The screensaver trick was a bit of a nuisance. It was better than nothing, essentially. And the glitches would sometimes come back, even if you hadn't re-entered sleep mode again, requiring you to activate the screensaver yet again. Nuisance aside, I still didn't need metal support on this machine, so I was holding off until the Mac would start randomly locking up, proceeding to lose whatever was open at the time and requiring a forceful reboot. Turns out, this was a symptom of early GPU failure. Make sure you hit that like, subscribe, and bell icon to see how I fixed it. This is the AMD Fire Pro M5100, probably the best GPU upgrade available for certain 2009 to 2011 iMacs, with some caveats. Let's start with some background information on Mac GPUs. While most Mac models have their graphics processors permanently soldered to the logic board, or weird proprietary interfaces, I'm looking at you, Trashcan Mac Pro. Some models did use industry standard graphics interfaces like PCI Express or Mobile PCI Express. It's also important to know that Mac graphics cards have different V-bias or video bias than PC cards. Mac cards will not display an image on a PC because the PC bias, EFI, doesn't know how to properly initialize the card. The PC cards often won't work in the Mac for the same reason. So I'm going to show you how I got a PC version of the AMD Fire Pro 5100 working on this 2009 iMac running Monterey. There are two key things for this GPU to work properly. Proper settings in open core so it can pick up the GPU on boot and a custom V-Bias flash to the card. You'll want to get OpenCore set up prior to physically changing out your graphics card. Without the proper OpenCore settings, the card will not display a picture on the internal LCD. If the existing card is completely dead and you can't boot the system, there are ways around this, but they become even more complicated and involved. Google's your friend on this one. There is also a minimum version of OpenCore you must be on for this particular upgrade to work, and you have to use the terminal version. While I don't recall what the minimum version was, I used and would recommend version 0.4.6 TUI or later. 0.4.6 is the last pre-compiled TUI version or terminal version offered. I choose Advanced Settings for Developers Only, Set Generic Bootstrap, choosing option 2, X64 EFI, then return to Previous Menu. Now I set Metal GPU Status and choose Option 4, which is AMD Legacy GCN. Now I can build OpenCore again and reinstall to the boot partition. Now for the V-Bias. The V-Bias is very specific to the card and often down to the revision of the card. I've linked to the forum post down below where I found most of this information. There are many ways to flash a custom V-Bias to a card of which include booting and flashing directly from Linux, using a USB programmer from Windows, or a Raspberry Pi via the GPIO pins. I'm using the flash ROM utility on Raspberry Pi with the Pi connected to the BIOS chip via a chip clip to the GPIO pins. I backed up the original BIOS twice to be safe, then flashed the custom ROM that matched my card revision. It is very important to make sure prior to installing the new card, that the Mac is booting by default to the OpenCore EFI partition. Even with the OpenCore adjustments, and even with the custom V-Bias, there is no access to the system's boot picker with this GPU installed, even while holding the option key on boot. This is because the system's native EFI cannot boot the card and relies on OpenCore to load and subsequently initialize the card. This is why it's so critical to ensure that OpenCore is properly configured and boots by default without any user intervention, since you'll be running blind up until this point. Now the new GPU can be fitted to the original cooler. As per the forum post, the GPU die height is shorter on the new GPU compared to the stock one. This means that the GPU die does not receive adequate cooling. This can be solved by installing a copper shim with thermal paste on both sides to extend the die height. I then reassembled as usual. Now the new GPU can be installed. 
If you have properly flashed the ROM file and properly modified your OpenCore settings, you should now be booting directly into Monterey and should have full metal hardware acceleration working. Okay, that seemed like a lot of work, and it was. In fact, I ran into a lot of problems along the way. Some of the documentation is difficult to understand, but after a lot of testing and experiments, I've made this video to show you the best and easiest process to get it working. So why do people like using this card if it's such a hassle? Well, my guess is a couple of reasons. One, the card is super cheap, around 50 bucks on eBay and has good availability. Second, native driver support. It's not a mangled driver hack to provide metal support. It's officially and fully supporting metal acceleration using the built-in native macOS drivers. Third, minor hardware modifications. Many of these cards differ enough that the original coolers need to be significantly modified, whereas this one will work by just adding that copper shim. The overall results? Excellent! This thing works absolutely flawlessly with this upgrade. The random crashes are now completely gone, the screensaver trick is gone, and the Mac goes in and out of sleep mode every single time without fail. This thing truly works as good as a brand new Mac at this point. In the 2009 versus 2020 iMac video, the stock 2009 GPU struggled to hit 14 frames per second in the Heaven benchmark. Running that benchmark again after the GPU upgrade, we're not really seeing much of an improvement in 3D performance. While it falls short, GPU performance was never the reason for this upgrade. The purpose of this upgrade was to make the system more stable and bring metal support for metal apps if they were desired to be used in the future, such as iMovie or the built-in Maps app. With that said, this project was a ton of work, but an ultimate 100% success. From a usability perspective to a light home user, this iMac is nearly indistinguishable from an officially supported Mac. It's been weeks since the upgrade was done, and I've literally found no compromises from a usability perspective. I'm very happy with the results, and I hope you've enjoyed this video. Remember to share this video, hit that like, subscribe, and bell icon. And comment below to say what you thought, or tell how your experience went with a similar upgrade. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.